I am uh, Steve Hansen. This is uh, September 10th, 2015, Sacramento, California. I'm with my friend Andrea Lepore, and I'm 35. Hi, I'm Andrea Lepore. I am 10 years older, 45. It's September 10th, 2015. We're in Sacramento, California, and I'm talking with my good friend Steve Hansen. So Andrea, it's been uh, it's been an interesting friendship that we've had, and uh, I was thinking about it because I'm about to go on this uh, charity bike ride for Best Buddies International, which helps people with developmental disabilities. And at first, I was only thinking about our brothers, right? right. I have a brother with autism who's five years older than me, and I know you have a brother who's uh, five years. He is six years older. Yeah, who also yeah. has some uh, disabilities, and. Um, at first I was thinking we were just going to talk about our brothers, but then I realized when I first started training on my bike, it was with you. And um, cycling uh, became an outlet right after I got elected for for me to kind of spend some time with myself and clear my head. And that was for the AIDS ride, which also, you know, uh, NorCal AIDS cycle, which was a big deal. So I just wanted to ask you, um, you have this huge love of cycling. Your mm-hmm. business, uh, Hot Italian, has bikes embedded in its culture, you know, everywhere. What What is your passion for bikes rooted in? Well, gosh, I mean, as far back as I can remember, I used to ride, um, and probably some of my happiest memories as a child were riding my bike, either with friends or by myself. And um, kind of like you, uh, when I was working on opening Hot Italian, I would ride my bike a lot, and some of my best ideas would come writing and um and yeah i just i think writing has a gives you a sense of freedom and and you feel like you're not um you're doing something good you're not driving a car and you know sending out co2 into the air and (laughs) and uh yeah it's a it's an awesome feeling so it's funny you mentioned as a kid you did that because i did the same Mm -hmm. but for me because my childhood had a lot of disturbance in it I would get on my bike and go as a way to be away from home Mm -hmm. because I didn't want to be at home uh, whether it was with my mom or dad or whoever was going on because that place wasn't great and so bicycling interestingly as a kid was a way to escape um, as well and I don't know did you feel that is that um I mean my early on my childhood was was great um uh, and then my parents divorced when I was four um, and then things got a little unsettling. Mm. You know, my mom married someone that I didn't really care for. <laughs> did your so, dad remarry? He did. Mm-hmm. And then he uh, passed away 25 years ago. Mm. So, yeah, there was a time, I think, probably after I was four, when yeah, the, we, the family split up. You know, he um, moved up to Alaska. He was stationed up there. Um and then he got diagnosed again. Uh, he, his cancer went into remission and then mm. seven years later diagnosed again. Um, so, yeah, it was early on it was great. And then, you know, mid-childhood mm. got a little rocky. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Mm. We've never talked about that, mm. but my parents were when I was three. Wow. And I lived yeah. with my mom until I was about 10. In and then she Minnesota? Had a, yeah, 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 in Minnesota, St. Paul, where I grew up. She had a lot of problems. We moved around almost every year to a different yeah. place. But um, I went to live with my dad when I was 10 because my mom had had some abusive boyfriends. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the she, was, she totally was unstable. But what's interesting is neither of them ever remarried. Oh. And, and so, you know, as I hear you talk about divorce I felt that but then I also felt they never remarried and so there's a strange bond between them Mm -hmm. over the course they still never got married no uh, I mean my dad died um, about 10 years ago Mm -hmm. now a little over and my mom's still in Minnesota but for whatever reason uh, they were young when they uh, my mom got pregnant with my brother as I understand it and got married and uh, they didn't have a happy marriage by any means but um, it was interesting that because they never got remarried, that kind of was their default, and they would fight like cats and dogs, but they still had this bond and, and in a strange way, I think, still loved each other because mm-hmm. of the kids right. and mm-hmm. their own attachments. But it was um, it's interesting because I never uh, – I always wondered what would happen if they remarried, and I guess 
having heard you talk about that a little bit, and maybe you want to talk more about it. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously can't speak for my mother, but I'm I'm sure she would have probably wanted to stay married longer, too. And my dad was a great guy. Um, from what I remember, I was uh, 19 when he passed, and like I said, I'm 45 now. Um, but he was, you know, a Renaissance guy and, you know, was in, in the Air Force as a dentist, but very passive guy. He was really an artist, a sculptor, played the flute, um, very athletic, played football in college. Um, did you know was, him very well after the I, divorce? Um, I did, um, but he was, like I said, he was stationed in, in Alaska, and then um, after he got diagnosed, he requested to be moved uh, down to Vacaville, to mm. Travis. So he could be closer to us. I was the closest one to him more than my brother and sister, um, just because he, I, I don't think, was the greatest dad when they were little. Um, and I had a lot more in common mm. with him um, with, between sports and, and music. And he was like, you know, he was a yoga instructor. He was like, <laughs> not an Air Force guy at all. Do you, how do you think that influenced you? I mean, the separation and him being far away and then sort of watching him uh, decline as a young person. Because right now, you, I look at you and I can't imagine how proud he would be. I mean, you're in design school, yeah. you have restaurants, you're you're like yeah. doing all these amazing things and it sounds a lot like... you trying to make me cry, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it sounds a lot like uh, you're you're living up to to that legacy. Yeah. No, I mean, I think about it a lot. I mean, I think that he would be, um, he would be proud, I think. And, um, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, even my uncle, um, who's his brother always says, you know, it's weird because you have like manners, mannerisms <clears throat> like him and, um, things that, you know, like I said, he's been gone for 25 years. That, you know, you don't pick up necessarily, um, but it's more natural, I think. Yeah. So, anyway. Well, but I mean, <laughs> like Barbara Walters in here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, I mean it's hard. I mean, having lived through my dad's death and yeah. Are you trying... were you more like your dad or? You know, I, 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 I look back and um, some people are convinced that I was adopted, <laughs> and that's no offense to them, yeah. but um, I'm very different, and I think mm. it's partially because I grew up mostly by myself. Mm. You know, my brother. Uh, when I was seven, my mom was, like I said, not very stable. And so she, w when a kid has autism, like my brother did, the instability is horrible. And right. he had yeah. a lot of behavioral challenges because mm -hmm. of that. And so at a certain point, she couldn't handle him because she couldn't right. give him stability. And I don't even know if she truly understood that. Um, but he went to live in a group home uh, when I was seven. And so that was pretty young. I remember when we lived together in the last apartment we lived in together, we had these two twin beds in the same room. And I just remember this vivid thing that he would break my toys. <laughs> and I was just really pissed off as a kid that I had so few toys, but he would break my toys. You need to get Nerf toys. Yeah. Or like... Um, <laughs> When I was even younger, uh, I had a big wheel. You know, that oh, was, yeah. like, an amazing thing. It's like a four- or five-year-old. And he left it on the train tracks near the house, and it got wow. <laughs> it got destroyed. Did you tie it to the tracks? Uh, probably, <laughs> with a little, like, flag. So he was, wait, older than you? He's five years older, five years yeah. Old. Okay. And, you know, ironically, um, well, that was a really difficult time in our lives. Um, I look back, and I think... It might have been one of the best things that ever happened to him because that group home that he went to was a small one. But the woman who ran it, Kathy, uh, he was there until he was 21. And then when he aged out, she had grown so close to him. He still lives with her and her family. Oh, and he's great. 41 now. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's 20 years. And she has been a mother to him, which is very hard for my mother because she feels this sense of kind of inadequacy, I think, sometimes. Right, right. Um, but he has had a far better life almost because of that fork in the road. And then, you know, I lived with my mother for another three years and had to put up with a lot of things that were really hard. Um, and then I went to live with my dad. And as I got to know him, as I was older, and he had his own challenges. And I, looking back, think that he probably in the 1950s when he was a kid 
had a mild form of autism mm-hmm. himself because he loved routine. Right. He would show up to work an hour early every day. He had his regime. Mm-hmm. And without that, he felt like he wasn't in charge, a lot like somebody on the spectrum. Right. And so, um, well, he was very smart and knew a lot about different things. He had a hard time communicating. He couldn't really interact with people socially very well. And so um, I think he probably has it was on that spectrum as well. Interesting. And so I think now I look at my brother and where he is, and um, it's interesting to look at my family and try to understand where I come from. Well, why did you move from your mom's to your dad's? So uh, the last, I think the, the, the thing was that my mom lost her apartment. I was in fourth grade. I was going to an elementary school, a public elementary school. And I kind of, as a kid, bounced between four or five different elementary schools. One of them being, for a year and a half, the elementary school my dad went to, which was a Catholic elementary school near the house that he grew up in which he lived in, um, that was my grandparents, and after they died, he, um, he inherited it. But uh, as much as I can remember, I think she lost the apartment. She had some abusive boyfriends, and you know we were living, I think, on a couch for a little while out of friends of hers, oh. and she was just a mess. Um, it's hard to say that, knowing how that might make her feel, but I went to live with my great-grandma for about two, three months. She was in her 90s with well, a 10 year old, <laughs> right? It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work and- um, Does she cook? Uh, yeah, she's an interesting yeah. woman. I'd love to talk about her some, but um, uh, right before Easter in 1990, uh, I was 10, uh, I went to go live with my dad. And that was a huge change for him and for me. Cause I didn't, you know, I had a lot of things I had to work through and he didn't quite know how to be a dad for someone who needed so much but he ended up we've kind of muddled through it for a long time and then figured it out but did he ask you to move in or do you remember i think i I don't know you know when you're a kid sometimes things just happen right Um, i think it was the logical alternative to my mom and you know uh the family really tried to help her a lot my great grandmother i think was um, very emotionally attached to my mom even though for her kids she was very distant so she was born in 1902 and ended up dying at 107. Wow. But um, she was a big part of my life because as a kid, she used to come pick me up. We'd go to the science museum or That's we'd cool. go do things. And then as, as, as she got older and declined, she actually lost her ability to drive around the time I got the ability to drive. So there's this role reversal. Right. And she was too proud to ask most people to come and pick her up because she outlived two husbands. You know, in the 1940s, when her first husband died of a heart attack, she was left with kids, and she decided that she was going to take over the family mortuary business at a time when women were not funeral directors, did not run businesses. And um, I think a lot of people told her not to do it, but she said thank you very much and did (laughs) did it anyways and ended up um, kind of leading a change in that whole industry where instead of these cold kind of mortuaries as they used to be called Mm -hmm. it became a funeral home and she she decorated this new chapel um to be a warm comforting place rather than a cold kind of um sterile place and uh helped lead the change in that industry as a woman as one of the first women funeral directors in minnesota and uh she was just a big person in my life i don't think i would be here um without her yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it sounds like she influenced you a lot by showing you some culture and you know, museums and, and... Tenacity. You know, yeah, <laughs> right. That you, know, it, you know, right. it had two sides to it, yeah. you know. Um, it certainly drove her forward and compelled her, but also made her sometimes out of reach for her own kids who were struggling with their own issues. Mm-hmm. But uh, when she was born... Um, her mother died in childbirth, the story goes, mm-hmm. and their dad basically was a drunk and rejected her. And her oh. dad's mother, her grandmother, was older and uh, didn't really have a choice but uh, raised her sort of um, uh, not not in a welcoming kind of way but a kind of a begrudging way. And so she muddled herself, and she had to be very strong, you know, German-French woman, um, and uh, in the 1920s, 
she uh, had a job. She was going to the University of Minnesota, and she was working at the library, you know, in the St. Paul Library and taking the trolley there and into class and kind of made her own way. And so um, it was. it's pretty fascinating to see that, especially as I face my own challenges trying to um, – be a city council member and a first openly gay one, but also somebody who wants the city to grow and change and not to let the adversity um, deter, right? Right. You yeah, know, that's just, what I was going to ask you. I mean, what made you really decide that, you know, you move here, you're obviously not from here, and which I think is sometimes rare for people to run for city council if it's not their hometown and... and um, to really dedicate themselves to to the public like that, um, you know, kind of what drove you to do that? Um, if 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 I'm honest with myself, I look back at this um, childhood which was adverse, and every step of my life has been because a lot of people cared about me who didn't have to, mm-hmm. and I really I'm here because my uncles, my grandma. Uh, people who are friends of the family watched out for me, and I, I have to believe that I wouldn't be here. I mean, from the soup kitchen my mom and I would go to as a kid, uh, which was the um, Dorothy Day Center in St. Paul, to things like that. I mean, I am here because society cared about someone they didn't have to. And as I grew up, went to college, I joined the National Guard, Army National Guard, when I was in high school, because I really didn't believe I'd be able to pay for college. And I I knew that I had to do something to to break that um, paradigm, that that right. cycle, Get and out. so I went to basic training. And I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> that that took a lot of slack out of my character. I'm sure. And um, uh, but as I as can I can you still do one arm push ups though. I can never do one. <laughs> you know, I I actually got a nomination from Bruce Vento, a congressman in Minnesota, to go to West Point. Wow. And, yeah, I was nominated, and you have to go through all these different things to get an appointment oh, yeah, and uh, to be able to go. Right. And I was, I had some friends that had went from my, my high school. I did junior ROTC, so. Um, I, but need when see, it, I need to see these photos in the uniform. Oh, yeah, people, people <laughs> love the photos, uh, especially the before and after. <laughs> but uh, the barrier to me going to West Point was 10 pull-ups. Really? Yeah, I, you can do ten uh, pull-ups I, now. No, I can't. I have long arms. <laughs> it's the the short arm people have such an advantage the in the pull-up game. <laughs> uh, but uh, it it was an interesting thing to go through, and then being gay, knowing actually when I was at basic training, I was like, you know, if I can get through this, where they gas you and you got to crawl on your hands and knees under barbed wire while they're shooting over your head, doing all these yeah, other things. Right. Uh, I could probably be gay. Right. I think I can survive that. <laughs> you can get through anything. Right. And so I began coming out, frankly, because I was just, I felt empowered by having uh, persevered through basic training. And um, ironically, that was around the time of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so as I left to go to college, I went to basic training between my junior and senior year of high school. At Fort Lost in the Woods, Missouri, as they call it, <laughs> Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, um, which was miserable in the summer. And as a 17-year-old, being one of the youngest, because you can go with your parents' permission before you turn oh, 18, okay. and they split your basic training with your advanced training. And is it two years or four? Uh, the commitment? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's uh, six plus another two. Wow. But I, and then my senior year got an ROTC scholarship. So even though West Point didn't work out, I received an ROTC scholarship and I was looking at schools and chose to go to Gonzaga. But I was kind of trying to serve my country because I felt this call to service, you know, the Catholic notion of servant leadership and giving back and all that. But also I felt there was a lot of dignity in it and I felt like it was um, uh, regimented in a way that would be really beneficial to me. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, it was almost like this these tectonic plates pulling apart as a canyon. The, the more empowered I felt as somebody used to call me a meek child, which probably is hard for people like you <laughs> to, that know me <laughs> right, to think of not, me as meek. No. Uh, but I was described as meek and shy and not... not by, by teachers or friends? By or? teachers and friends. And I came back from basic training much more 
comfortable with mm-hmm. myself and mm-hmm. speaking out. Um, but I could feel uh, that sort of um, Looney Tunes kind of thing happen <laughs> where the chasm opens and your legs kind of try to keep it keep Together. standing right. as yeah. the as as you straddle something one of them was my commitment to the uh, military which i felt very strongly about and one was being myself as a as a gay man and as i got to college that got too far apart right. and so as i started ROTC there i realized i couldn't reconcile um my commitment with who i was and i had all these conversations with one of my mentors, Raymond Reyes, who is the VP for diversity at Gonzaga that I work for. And all of a sudden, I just had this sea change in my life where I decided that, you know, I would not pursue the ROTC scholarship, which actually ended up invalidating kind of my guard commitment. And I changed my job. Um, I went to go work for Raymond. I So I did diversity training. I helped on a lot of things in school. But uh I, I, I changed my life so I could be who I was because I realized I couldn't live as somebody who I wasn't. Right. And what the damage that had begun to do to me was just too profound to accept, especially as I looked forward into the world and didn't see myself in it. I mean, that was a very terrible thing. Well, and you were young to figure that out, which is, I think, amazing because a lot of people... They may know early on, but they don't make that decision um, until much later in life. Or, you know, maybe they get married first and have yeah. kids, and then it, you know, becomes much more complicated. But know. just think of that sea change. I mean, I, right. when did you come out? Uh, oh, gosh, nineteen twenty, I think. Around the time of your dad's passing, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, about a year after. You know. Did that, was that connected? I don't think so. I do remember my father once um, asking me, because he was much more, like I said... Perceptive? <laughs> right. <laughs> You'd say that. Um, no, he. Was, I mean, he was a very shy, reserved person, um, but he was, you know, he was into metaphysical... Um, like I said, he was a yoga instructor, mm-hmm. and he was just... Um, he read a lot, and... Um, I think we were just much more connected, and and, um, and so he he asked me when I was a teenager. Um, we actually had gone to see the Harvey Milk uh, documentary, mm. and uh, when he was stationed up in Alaska, and um, when we were leaving the theater, he said, "You know," um, he said, "Are you gay?" I said, "No, of course not. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous." So and that and then he never asked me again, and you know, and then he. Did you know in your head at that time? Oh yeah, though? yeah. I knew when I was, since yeah. I was probably three. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I liked my second grade teacher. Do you wish, <laughs> uh, looking back and uh, in, you know not having had your dad since you were nineteen, do you wish you had answered that question differently? Yeah, I think there's a lot that I uh, regret about um, with him. I think that was one. Mm-hmm. Um, I recently I, um, I had found a letter, a note because he used to write me letters and, and do drawings and, and things in them and he had asked me to come live with them hmm. and um, I had told him no because I didn't want to leave my friends and you know silly reasons I was playing sports and hmm. didn't want to you know because we'd moved around so much like yourself when I was younger so I didn't want to you know, I finally met you know friends and had a comfortable situation and didn't want to upset the apple cart again so I did but I do regret not not going to live with him. Well, and him being able to know you for all of who you were, I mean, right. that's yeah. a it's a strange thing I think about because when I left home to go to college, I wanted to go far away because I felt like I needed this distance. My dad, um, I think he was he was afraid of being alone, so he actually told me I'm not paying for no college. Wow. Um, at a, it like at, that. at a malt <laughs> shop because he loved malts and onion rings and burgers. But I think it, I understood it at the time as his reaction to me leaving, not as like a, I don't want you to succeed, but I don't want to be alone. I'm afraid right. of that. Right. Um, even though we we had our differences as boys and their dads do, um, but also I had to figure out myself. But what was horrible is that he never really got to know me as a gay man either, even though he, I was, it, it's a, 
I've been thinking back because it was about 10 years ago, like I said. Um, and um, we had, I was working at Equality California as this advocate, legislative advocate. This was after college? Yeah, after mm -hmm. college. And I just, we worked on the marriage bill in 2004 to try to get that passed for the first time. You know, Mark uh, Leno had oh, introduced right. the bill mm -hmm. uh, right before Gavin Newsom started marrying people in San Francisco right. and the Massachusetts court. And it was kind of like, all of a sudden I was deep in the weeds on a huge issue as a 23-year-old trying to make change. And um, we were pretty more successful that first year than we thought, but we literally, the day before I got the call that my dad had a heart attack, we had just done a big press conference in San Francisco oh. with um, Cecil Williams um, from Glide and Mark Leno and all these people to reintroduce the bill in December 2004. And uh, the next day I was in the office doing some work and um, I got a call from my dad's best friend who he worked with that that he had had a heart attack at work. And it wasn't until then I realized how how far away I was, but also that I had this deep sense of loyalty and love and whatever for him. Um, so I flew home, like, literally within two or three hours, I was on a plane to Minnesota. And you already had come out to him? No. Oh, I he mean, didn't know. Well, I mean, I was just, oh, I was away. I'd come home for Thanksgiving, uh, but that was about it. You know, I didn't have right. a lot of money then. Right. To right. travel was really expensive. It just felt right. like an indulgence. Right. Uh, when I first finished my fellowship here, I barely had five bucks. I mean, someone sent me five dollars and a birthday card once. I thought it was Christmas. I mean, <laughs> but was I it wrapped in in uh, aluminum foil like my grandmother used to do? No, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, but it was appreciated anyway. I flew home and uh, I got there and I walked into his hospital room and uh, it was the last time I really got to talk to him. He uh, he was conscious. He looked fine. I felt actually kind of dumb for flying home. And then that night, uh, I got his truck. I, I went back and tried to figure out what I needed to do for him. He uh, had heart failure, mm -hmm. and um, they had to put a balloon in his heart to pump, and he was transferred to the University of Minnesota. And ultimately, he had to be put in an uh, induced coma for a period of time. Um, oh. And so he was in ICU. I had all these doctors, you know, cardiologists, surgeons, all these different people, and they put in... Um, uh, what are called ventricular assist devices for both sides of his heart, left and right. And um, they lost his glasses. And I, I remember this, um, they were going to be bringing him out of the coma to see um, how he was. But he was literally for like 10 days totally sedated um, so that he didn't cause any harm to his body. Right, right. And um, I went to the place where he got his eyeglasses and I had them make another pair because they had the record. So they did that, and this wonderful young woman came and fitted him in the hospital with them uh, when he woke up, and uh, he couldn't see wow. because of the brain damage from right. lack of oxygen. Uh, and so it damaged his nerves, and we put the glass on him, and he couldn't, couldn't see. see it no. It wasn't long after that that he threw some clots, and like right before Christmas. So was he in the hospital the whole time? Yeah. Then he yeah. never got out? Never got out. He And we had to take him off life support not long after. And it was a very – my lobbying skills came into effect <laughs> because uh, I had to work with all these kind of pushy doctors and things. And he had a great cardiologist, but the heart surgeon, when we decided as a family to take him off life support, uh, reversed our orders. The heart surgeon decided that wow. we, he wasn't going to allow that. And I ended up having to fire the heart surgeon that saved his life. And in that conversation, because I was livid, we had gathered the family oh, yeah. to take him off life support. My brother, my brother had come. When was the last time your brother saw him? In the hospital after he came off life mm -hmm. support. And literally this doctor, this surgeon, decided on his own that he would override us. Anyway, I sat him down and I said, you know, why are you doing this? You saved his life. He said, well, my Christian values don't allow me to, to, to let this happen. I said, well, 
I appreciate what you've done for him, but that's not appropriate. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to uh, fire you from his care. You're no longer allowed to look after him. And so... It's pretty brave. I mean, you were 23 at the time. Yeah, 24 by then, yeah. And so it was like, uh, you know, he saved his life, but then uh, wanted to deprive him of the quality and the dignity of right. of his life. Right. Um, and that was Christmas time, you said? Yeah, right before. so weird because it, um, that's when my dad passed away. It was around Christmas, yeah. too, and... Um, I don't know. You probably felt the same way where Christmas was never really the same yeah. <laughs> for a long time. No, it wasn't. And uh, it was um, the 23rd. It was probably the night of the 22nd. He threw the clots. And I had a phone call on the 23rd of December 2004 that he had uh, had these clots that came to his brain and blocked blood flow. Caused a pretty significant amount of brain damage, and that's when I knew that we would have to probably take him off life support right, on the yeah. 23rd. Um, it was a devastating decision, um, but I wanted to make sure that I lived up to his um, expectations, and he was not somebody who would have wanted to live as a vegetable, right, which no. he could have maybe had a heart transplant before that, but... Once he threw those clots and the brain damage was so bad, yeah. uh, I knew, but I didn't want to ruin everyone else's Christmas, so I didn't tell anybody for uh, till the 26th. Well, and to have him suffer any longer, I mean, it's right. just, it's um, inhumane. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, but um, it was, uh, there's a lot of good bonding time there, but I felt like, you know, he took care of me, and I got to take care so, of him. Yeah. And it was one of those things that, you know, we, <laughs> you hope that uh, you outlive your parents, but not quite like that. Right. Yeah. And be able to return to them what they did for you. Yeah. It was just one of those moments where I felt an obligation to, to give back, right. even though it was really hard. And I could have been selfish and some people didn't, some people in the family didn't understand. Yeah. Well, I think that you're giving back to a lot of people here now, you know, in in Sacramento in, in many ways, and, and you may not know all the people that you um, are helping with your work that you do, um, but you're having a huge impact um, on on the Sacramento community. So, Well, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things is I, I, I value you so much as a friend because I see you doing the same thing. But almost unprovoked. <laughs> and it seems like you have the same desire to improve the world around you, but with your own special kind of talents. Um, and, you know, I, Hot Italian, uh, this fabulous restaurant, bike shop, car showroom, uh, sundry place, uh, uh, was a fireplace store prior to you doing that. And yeah. that place, that corner was dead. It was a dead, um, definitely in Midtown for sure. But I think you know the the timing really worked out. You know, with with us coming in there, with with you being elected, and and, you know, and the economy finally turning around. And, and um, I mean, it's an exciting time really to be here. And, and I think that there's so much opportunity here, but at the same time, we have to to do it right because since we do have um, so much development and empty lots and a new arena and a stadium and, and, and those opportunities don't come around very often. And if we don't How do did it, you create how to, t how, I mean, I know you and Fabrizio kind of put it together right, right. Um, as your partner and mm -hmm. pizza. <laughs> right. Yep. But, uh, you know, I don't think any, it's like the iPhone before you saw it, you would have never expected it. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm right. I'm proud that we were able to create something that was original. I think, um, you know, no one else is, we didn't copy it from somewhere else or, or, um, you know, bring it from another city. Um, it, it was all original from, from both his pizza and, and, and my design. So, um, so yeah, it's been a great experience. Was it hard? Oh, there was lots of hard parts for sure, but... Tell I, me about it. <laughs> you don't want to talk about it? Well, no, I mean, the building was difficult because it was uh, built in the 50s. It was a retail store in a, basically a cold shell 
um, you know, concrete block. Mm -hmm. So turning a concrete block building into a, you know, warm restaurant is not the easiest thing. And, and I wanted to make it green. Right. Um, so. But modern, green. too. I mean, this mm -hmm. is not like an old school pizza parlor with, right. you know, checkered vinyl tablecloths. Right. And, yeah, tomato cans. No, we, yeah. want, we wanted it to make it, to have it be a welcoming community gathering place. You know, we have Tower Records' old phone number, and, and I have so many great memories of Tower um, growing up being a community gathering place. And that's exactly what we wanted to turn it into, too. Yeah, it is so. It is sort of um, the go-to spot for the neighborhood. Well, we know. we are, are proud of that, and, and I think that um, as Sacramento c continues to grow, hopefully we can influence... Uh, some of the direction in terms of sustainability and, and biking and, and, and good design you know, well, with, with your help. <laughs> well, good, des good design. You would think that uh, a lot of Sacramento, um, there's a great uh, Frank Lloyd Wright quote, uh, doctors can bury mist their mistakes, but architects plant vines. <laughs> right. uh, and I, I see a lot of vines in Sacramento, so we definitely mm -hmm. need, need more design. But the Del Paso Design District, which you helped create and all the wonderful murals, I don't know if you... I know we only have a few minutes left, but do you want to? Right. Well, I think that, you know, good design is something that we all need to um, be aware of and be champions for and, and, and push back on on developments like you have um, because, you know, now's our opportunity, now's our chance to to really make Sacramento a beautiful destination, mm -hmm. not just for the residents, um, but people coming to visit and... Um, we have empty lots in every street now, and if we don't fill them with, with the right projects, we'll really regret it later on. Would you say uh, design is the spirit of a city? I think so. I think in, in everything that we do, I mean, the farm to fork is is an industry for sure, but then how we apply that um, to sustainability and to design and, and, and to our economy. Do you think Sacramento has a sense of self-esteem again, given how hard the recession was and everything else? I think so, but it's I, I don't think it's warranted because we have, you know, UC Davis is an amazing uh, school that, you know, there's, they get more research, research grants than MIT. But they're in Davis. But, Come on. Right. That's across the causeway. <laughs> it's close. It's our region. I mean, there's so many graduates from UC Davis, yeah. including myself, that you know that are from here, and, and we want them to stay here and have an impact on the community. Right. But Sac State's on the march, too. I know they're trying to make their, their mark. And, you know, for a city of our age, it's unique that our educational institutions aren't more at the forefront. But uh, I just wanted to ask you, too, um, you know, you have, you're about to finish this degree. What's the one thing you want to make sure you leave behind? You know, we talked about your dad and his legacy being part of you. What, mm -hmm. what do you want? Because you, you told me before you don't want kids. You want to give back more through other people. And what, what do you right. want to leave behind? Uh, I think, you know, like I said, good, you know, design, sustainability are really my, um, what's in my ethos and, and what we're, we try to um, really instill in in what we do at Hot Italian and as in other projects that I'm working on as well. And um, I think that it's just we're at this critical juncture in our community, and we need to really um, pay attention to those things. Yeah, because yeah. I think about that question for myself yeah. and uh, for all the work. Uh, I'm, I'm in this great relationship right now. and I love Michael. Yeah, he's he's wonderful, <laughs> and he's healthy for me. Yeah, you know, yes. he, 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 he knows how to uh, help me be a better person. But I, I also think about, you know, the fact that uh, my family life was rough, so I want to have a family and give back and uh, leave behind a legacy that uh, is, is, is kids probably, if – now that we can get married right. and, you know, that was off the I'm table. I'm not babysitting, and, though. We, we've <laughs> got, uh, we've got other offers. <laughs> Thank you very much. I will take the dogs. Uh, I bet you will, actually. <laughs> you, you see the kid and you'll be like, okay. <laughs> all right, You're maybe. a softy. You're a softy. We'll go eat gelato. But I, I, I know that there's all these wonderful things I can do for other people. But I think one of the wonderful things we can do for the world is to have great children who – inspire and and build on that legacy because right, right. I feel the with the weight of my ancestors in a way and because my brother won't have children 
I, I feel like otherwise the, the family line really dies. And I, I think that there's an opportunity, though, to pay forward everything that's right. been given to me in that way. Well, fortunately, my sister and cousins all have kids. So, <laughs> so you're okay. <laughs> it's like, yes, we're the good. The Lepores yes, live strong. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think we're almost uh, done, but... Uh, well, I do have one last question yeah. for you that we can talk about, but um, why do you think that we are such good friends? Uh, you know, I was I was thinking about that. Uh, we came together um, during my campaign, and uh, I didn't really know you, but you're very... Uh, uh, supportive of this vision I had for a modern, vibrant city. And uh, then I, we got to know each other, and we have this fam family kind of similar story with our brothers and right. and being uh, LGBT and trying to figure that out, but also just like the camaraderie. Yep. You, you, you provide a laugh quite a lot, <laughs> and, and that's Try. always uh, uplifting. Sometimes I feel yeah. like uh, I'm a receiver of all, everybody's negative uh, things I've got this people have this problem that problem the world is ending and you bring some joy into to my life and I try you do you know you do. life is short we have to enjoy it why do you think we're friends I, I think for all those reasons I think we uh, you know have a connection on that level um, and we want to you know make our the place that we are a better place and and uh, Absolutely. And have fun doing it. So the last thing is uh, during my campaign, we adopted the slogan, every day is our chance to make this city a little better. Right. And I feel like that's what we're trying to do together. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it. Let's do it.